It's an honor to be with you guys, and uh, I just want to uh, thank CFAM and the leadership of CFAM for organizing this event and making possible, uh, making it possible for us to share an abolition perspective of the fight against the commercial uh, sexual exploitation of women and children in our world. I also want to thank um, one of my personal heroes um, who's on this panel, Rachel Morin, for her uh, courage in telling the world the truth about prostitution. And I encourage everybody, if you haven't read her book, Paid For, um, to get a copy of that and to read that book, because as Catherine McKinnon said, a uh, professor at Harvard University, it's the most important book ever written on prostitution. And the thing that I was struck by as I read it, one of the many things, was that the utter humiliation of the prostitution experience. And so it makes sense to me why there are so many in the sex industry who have crafted a cover narrative to insulate themselves from the reality of the harm of prostitution and to project it as something that's empowering. But Rachel has gone to places where few have in terms of bringing articulation and transparency to the experience of prostitution, um, really at her own expense. And um, so I think as an abolition movement, we are all indebted to her voice as one of the key, if not the key voice on the earth speaking into this issue. And there are just two things I wanted to quickly say um, as simply as I can before I, I uh, make my remarks as a filmmaker and abolitionist. A couple of things I wanted to mention um, in support of what Rachel was saying. And, and the first is, is this, is that we know that uh, sex trafficking, as it's being uh, termed, um, here today in child sex trafficking would not exist without male demand. Women and children are purchased one by one by one, and it's men who are using them one by one by one that is causing this industry to exist and to perpetuate. It would not exist. And so the idea that decriminalizing and fully legalizing prostitution is somehow advancing the cause of women as a human right does not make sense to me. It doesn't make sense because the prostitution industry necessitates demand. Not only does it necessitate demand, but it promotes demand. It markets demand. You have to have demand for a prostitution industry to exist. So to pretend, as many of the large anti-trafficking organizations do today, that they are fighting sex trafficking without taking a stance against prostitution or actually lending their voice to the cause of the pro-sex work movement is incredibly hypocritical and it actually undermines and subverts the, the real way to get to the root of this issue. So I wanted to say that in support of uh, Rachel's position and also wanted to express at the, in the same uh, tone that we cannot pretend to be pro-woman and gender and and in favor of gender equality and at the same time support this system of prostitution prostitution 100 percent of what happens in prostitution is a construct of male demand every single thing that happens in prostitution is a result of male demand by its very nature it is a system of gender inequality i asked one woman inside the sex industry who was promoting this idea of prostitution being glamorous and empowering and all of these things. And I said to her, have you ever had a client who violated the sexual boundaries that you had agreed upon before you went into the sexual encounter? And her response to me was this, don't all men. You see, she couldn't deny the fact that in prostitution, you do not get to define your sexual boundaries. We have laws about sexual harassment it is impossible to be in prostitution and for it to not to exist and continue on the premise of not just sexual harassment, but sexual violation of many degrees and kinds. So it's important for me to say that in support of uh, Rachel. Um, moving into uh, my thoughts regarding this uh, uh, from the perspective, as I said, of a filmmaker and abolitionist, I just want to share a few things. Um, I was, uh, dry I was driving in the back of a van on the outskirts of Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and I was being taken into a village called Swaipak, which is, um, has been considered the capital of child sex tourism. We 
you know, you don't, there's no street signs to get there, and it's kind of out of the way. It's a small village with dirt streets and dilapidated shacks, and the person who's going there has to know where you're going. So it's one of those things where you turn left at the blue fence, and you go right at the cow, and eventually you make your way into this, this small village. And as we're going down the street and seeing the shacks and brothels on either side, our van comes to a stop. And here we look over to our right, and I've got my film crew in the back with me, and here's a heavy set Western man bartering for sex with a child in front of one of these brothels. And it was in that moment that the statistics of child sex trafficking suddenly became personalized. It was a surreal experience to see a living human being actually trying to rationally negotiate a price to pay for sex with a child. So we get out of the van and and uh, I was warned not to make a scene in this town uh, by the host because they're doing some work there. Uh, but I couldn't help but approach this guy. Well, he saw us coming and, uh, and he goes up the street. My film crew says, what do we do? And I say, just turn on the camera. <laughs> you know, I don't know. And so here we are, this big film crew following this pedophile down the street. And suddenly he breaks into a sprint. So we find ourselves in a full chase. Um, through this village, out to the main highway, and he's jumping on the back of a moped taxi, and I grab him by the back of his shirt, and I yank him back, and I find myself face-to-face -face with a man who had flown halfway across the world to come buy a child for sex. I didn't even know what to say to him in that moment. Part of my, part of my heart broke because I realized this man's life had been so deeply fractured and reduced to such a pathetic, cowardly existence and I, I felt so much compassion for him. On the other side of me, I was filled with rage and anger that he was per perpetrating acts of sexual violence against children. And I wanted to go Jack Bauer on this man and, and to express to him my rage. And I just shook him and I said, don't ever come back to this place again. I don't know if he was more shaken or I was more shaken by this encounter. But what it uh, days later, it compelled me with this question and this thought that... This man didn't wake up one day and decide to go fly halfway across the world to go buy a child for sex. What happened in this man's life that brought him to this point? As we continued traveling the world and documenting um, in our film Nefarious the, uh, the global sex industry, we noticed, uh, and, and one of the things that stood out to us and was heartbreaking to us, was women for sale in places all over the world, like Amsterdam, where in this modern-day civilized Western country, we have a city where women are literally for sale in windows, where men, uh, British stag parties, 20, 30, 40 men, in a drunken stupor descend upon these women at all hours, where elementary school students are brought on field trips to come see the women for sale in the windows where they're used one after the other all day long um, and this, this image of women and children for sale placed all over the world I will never get out of my head but was more shocking to me than that was the men who were literally lining up in these places in all different red light districts around the world to buy these women. And we began to learn about statistics. 1.5 million purchases of sex per day in Germany. 1.5 million purchases of sex per day in Spain. 70% of men in Cambodia and Brazil buy women in the commercial sex industry, pay them for sex. So that we learned that this is a staggering problem. It's not, we're not talking about a few social derelicts on the, and a b bad apples on, on the margins of society. We are talking about a global cultural phenomenon on a planetary level that affects every society in our world today. And that's when I began to ask this question. What kind of society is producing so many men willing to buy a woman or child for sex? And it's that question that catapulted us into production on our next uh, documentary. In that documentary, we, uh, we discovered that we must look at the stories that we tell in our society that shape our conceptions of gender and sexuality. What are we saying in our society? What is the message and the story of the pop culture about what it means to be a man? what it means to be a woman, or what it means to be a sexual being. You see, it's these stories that we tell 
about our humanity that play a critical role in our socialization. It's uh, the internalization of these stories as we grow up that form and shape our values and our worldview. And my pursuit to answer these questions launched us into making this, other, this new documentary uh, to answer the questions of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a sexual being in today's world. What are the stories that we tell that socialize our kids into their conceptions of gender and sexuality? This is so foundational. Uh, because at the root of the commercial sex industry is male demand. And the demand that is cultivated in the soil of our pornographic culture. The problem that we are facing today is a pr problem of a facilitating culture. So I want to just show you a short trailer of the next film that we're coming out with that documents this issue. I think you're an absolute gorgeous girl, and I'd love to do it again. Wait, what? I think you're a gorgeous girl, and I'd absolutely love to do it again with you, dear. Okay, well, I'm sure we could probably work that out. Oh, fantastic. You want to know how easy sex is to get in America? If you want to follow me, I will show you. Well, let me show you. Oh, it's that easy. On the beach, we get drunk, we go back to the hotel, we have casual sex, and then we go about our lives like we never met. Like I said, I had sex in a porta party. I had sex on the beach. Hey. My man. Hey. Whether it's social media with the Instagram and the Facebook, and whether it's movies, TV shows, that's really what shapes our lives. I watch porn, she watches porn, he watches porn. Assume the position, girls. To be accepted and to be well liked, you need to be nude. You need to parse the line. If anything really fun or crazy arises, I'm not gonna say no to it. Do you wanna see her take her top off? <laughs> they're, they're asking for it. You want it to win, right? Girls like to show it off. Like, they act innocent inside, but they really do like to show it off. It just takes, you have to get it out of them, you know what I mean? Guys feel like spring break, you can do anything you want to. Usually the more intoxicated they are, the more likely they are to let you motorboat. You have to look and you scope them out. It's almost like motherfucking fishing. Good, 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 good. All girls are sluts. You can give them a couple Percocets and a beer and the panties drop. You Today, we bring a case forward of a gang rape type sexual battery that occurred in the broad daylight here on Panama City Beach. What we discovered in the making of this film is that the message to men in our culture, the story about men is that they're sexual predators. They're cast as sexual predators, and this is seen as a way to be a man to use women. Women are cast as sexual objects and taught that this is where their value comes from. It's, it's sad to me that girls growing up in this culture will be more likely to know the names of pop culture icons like Kim Kardashian and Miley Cyrus than they are to know the names of our three Fremo Supreme Court justices. This saddens me even just watching this video because it puts into perspective that what we are fighting for is the soul of a generation. As long as pornographic values continue to dominate the popular narrative of our culture, the sex industry will thrive. If we want to stop sex trafficking, we have to shift the pornographic culture that fuels it. We must reclaim our identity, and we must change the story that we are telling. 
Our world needs real men and real women, not fabrications of the culture. This will require us disavowing the culture's narrative and constructing a new one, one in which women are respected and valued for the diverse range of gifts that they bring into the world, not merely their sex appeal. Women are intellectual, emotional, spiritual, creative, athletic, familial, political, caring, compassionate, relational, and strong. They may have desires for autonomy and independence or family and children. Women are searching for deeper meaning and purpose. They have histories, memories, and unique experiences. They long to have an impact in the world. Simply put, women are not a sexual buffet for the gratuitous appetites of men. They are the image bearers of God and the crown of his creation. Similarly, men are not what the pop culture has constructed. We are not mindless, roving, sexual beasts without conscience. There are so many beautiful dimensions of manhood that are being obscured that we bring as a gift into this world. Men are strong, protective, communal, innovative, courageous, passionate, and have a capacity for great gentleness. We want to use our strength for purpose. We long for adventure. We desire intimacy. We want to be known and celebrated, loved and respected. Men are three-dimensional beings full of complexity and beauty. We must embrace the better angels of our nature and usher in a new generation of manhood, one based on honor, dignity, respect, vulnerability, empathy, and mutuality. Central to this is the way that we speak about and treat women. We must expose the bankrupt practice of using women to gain, for sex to gain status among other men. Being a player should not be a badge of honor, but rather a badge of disgrace. Esteeming women, engaging in loving relationships, and protecting the vulnerable are ways to respect oneself and advance the male gender. We must create a world where men are loving and respectful and women are valued and safe. And only then will we disrupt and eliminate sex trafficking in our world. Thank you.